today, Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick became the first sitting mayor to be charged with a crime in that city's history. In the past 30 days, I've been called a n more than any time in my entire life. In a city that's divided by color. It's no longer white flight from the city of Detroit. Now it is black flight from the city of Detroit. I've received more death threats than I have in my entire administration. Any merit to this, it seems they're playing the race card here. Well, it certainly seems like that. One man is yeah. the target of a political conspiracy. I cheated on my wife, John. Boy, if you had me and my wife text messages, dude, let me tell you something. <laughs> Don Diva Films presents a Flip Wilson production. Innocent people can go to jail or prison. People can literally get away with murder, murder, Murder. This is the Bobby Kilpatrick story. The rise and fall of power. This indictment alleges Kilpatrick received at least $640,000 of unreported taxable income. The nonprofit seemed to be more of a slush fund for the mayor and his pals. He's young, he's black. I'm not using the race card, not at all. But he's young, he's black. And I guess, you know, he made this mistake. They do not want to let it go. It is perhaps the most notorious unsolved murder in Detroit. Who killed stripper to The Violence in our city is uh, deplorable. Um, it's out of control. Never admit it, you know, so we'll never know. Bill Patrick's tangled web now jeopardizes what was once a promising fresh start for a struggling city. The son of a member of Congress and a county commissioner, he was elected in 2001 to great fanfare. It was a subdued Kwame Kilpatrick who spoke this morning, who stayed on message as he announced that despite felony charges against him, he would not resign. I look forward to complete exoneration once all the facts surrounding this matter have been brought forth. I think that he pissed a lot of people off. Kwame Kilpatrick, as a young boy, The 70s was a decade of enterprising ideas and monumental change. New Mega 747 jets were flying. The controversial case of Roe versus Wade was overturned and Richard Nixon was re-elected. It was a time for hippies and music lovers. It was a time for minorities that were stepping up into major cities like Detroit and becoming part of the political new way. Also during the 70s, an outspoken man became the first African-American mayor of Detroit. One of the first African-American mayors of any major city. His name was Coleman Young. He managed to beat out his white opponents, John F. Nichols, after a racially divided election, which recharged Detroit after the 1967 race riots. Throughout his 20-year tenure, much of his time was spent revitalizing the crime-ridden city by attracting new businesses and reinforcing the police department. Detroit is a warning, if anybody's listening. A year after the riot, a presidential commission predicted that America was heading toward a sort of reverse apartheid, poor black cities surrounded by rich white suburbs. This is the future they warned us about. And as for Detroit's future, well, some experts predict another 200,000 gone by the end of the decade. By then, the only people who haven't left Detroit may be those who can't. Detroit is armed and dangerous. There are an estimated 1.2 million guns here, more guns than there are people. <laughs> have to kill my brother. Last year, there were 400 children aged 17 or younger who were shot in the city. 40 were shot dead. It's like a whole generation is being wiped out. Are you proud of Detroit? Certainly I'm proud of Detroit. I wouldn't be here if I were not. 
Coleman Young has been the mayor of Detroit for the past 17 years. Is it a safe place to live, a good place to live, a good it's place a good to raise a family? a good place to live, and I think it's a, as safe as any other. Five streets down, you got crack dealers, and you know, you got people breaking in. They come down here, they see nice houses, they see nice things, and they want to break in. So, you know, I got to protect myself from them. Most big cities do have the same problems as Detroit, and in some cases, they're worse. Washington has more murders, L.A. has more gangs, New York has more racial violence. America's cities are on a dark and dangerous road. But you come here and you get the feeling that this, this is what the end of the road looks like. Here in Detroit, we have seen two worlds, one poor and black, one wealthy and white, two worlds with their backs turned to each other. Here in Detroit, we have seen the future, and it's frightening. There's not a body on every corner, and the average a citizen in this city is not confronted with the, the, the fear of his life. To, to attack Detroit is to attack black. Politicians run for office by attacking Detroit, by attacking Colbert Young. The media gets headlines. You're a symbol. By running bad, exactly. You got it. Coleman Young doesn't like criticism, especially from outsiders. But outsiders should take a look, a close look at Detroit and wonder, could it happen here? My family moved here when I was 14 years old. My father was in the military for 22 years. And after my father got out of the military, he got into insurance business and uh, decided to take a transfer to the Detroit area. 1989, I went into Detroit. I had a business in the Renaissance Center. I had to deal with the bureaucracy in the city just to have a business. Coleman Young would not roll over. He tried to give black people contracts. My name is Roy Godwin. Roy, R-O-Y, Godwin, G-O-D-W-I-N. I'm the host of Seven Days, the internet TV program that provides news and information that's relevant to the people of the city of Detroit. Me, I came from Jim Crow, Alabama when I was 14 years old. It wasn't racial tension on the parts of the people, of our people in the city of Detroit. It was this thing that they created, Detroit versus the suburb. I got to see firsthand what it's like to operate a business in the city, and, it was, and it's not business friendly. A lot of people moved out. They left the city. I think the city had a lot to offer. Well, the reality is, is there's no perfect politics. You know, uh, when, when politics serve one group, uh, the other group always throws up a red flag. So I grew up experiencing uh, being raised basically by a mayor who believed 100% in the city and the people in the city. When I was growing up, if you would have asked a black kid in Detroit if we thought there could be a black president, uh, because of what we saw from Coleman, I think your answer would have been yes. Young's contempt for the white suburbs has been a key part of his political success. Once, when the mayor was asked about enforcing gun control, he replied, I'd be damned if I'm gonna let them collect guns in the city of Detroit while we're surrounded by hostile suburbs. To the mayor, it's quite simply us versus them. He kind of drew a line at eight mile and said, you know, this is mine and that's yours and <laughs> you want to come in, you got to ask. <laughs> It's been proven over and over that blacks weren't able to survive in the makeup of white society. So Coleman, what he did with Detroit was he made Detroit an island. And we had control of our own destiny within, within our confines of our own city. In this country, black people are victims of racism. It's not accidental that the cities around the nation, they have the largest percentage of blacks, have the largest percentage of Poverty have the largest percentage of crime, have the largest percentage of unemployment. But in Detroit, blacks aren't just the majority, they're the authority. They run the police, the courts, the schools, and city hall. But black political power hasn't meant black economic prosperity. In my time in Detroit, I have driven and walked past mile after mile of decayed, rotting, Neighborhoods that look like war zones, of burned out buildings, I cracked have houses. If, you, if you've been coming in any length of time, those were there when I became mayor. And a whole lot of that's been restored. There are also people that say that any white mayor who had developed the downtown area and let the neighborhoods collapse would have been kicked out of office a long time ago. Well, that's bull. 
that pure propaganda. Neighborhoods collapsed because half the goddamn population left. In fact, Detroit, which at its peak in the 50s was home to 2 million and 80% white, today has less than 1 million, about 70% of them black. So now, when it's hammer time in the city, it's tea time in the suburbs. This is where whites went, taking their money and jobs with them. There are now more offices here than in Detroit, more stores too, so there's no reason to go to the city. The only thing the suburbs lack are blacks. One study called these among the most segregated suburbs in America. Suburbs created by white flight and black rage. Coleman Young was a man. Malik Shabazz, M-A-L-I-K-S-H-A-B-A-Z-Z. Coleman Young was a man's man, strong committed, intelligent, not intelligent in the traditional sense of books or accreditation, but common sense, mother's wit. And he loved his people. You know, he said, I was born black. I wasn't born a Democrat. Coleman Young's credibility has been hurt by a series of scandals. The latest involves charges that his police chief stole from a fund set up for undercover drug buys. Look, man, I have been hounded for 10 goddamn years with allegations, rumors, and not one concrete charge. Now, after 10 years, you get tired of that book. But your police chief? I wouldn't give a who it is. It's an investigation. There have been no findings. Well, he achieved the, uh, the name, the cussing mayor, because, you know, Coleman uh, pretty much kept it real as far as the language went. I think that, you know, a gentleman from Coleman's time, uh, that, that language signified the passion or, you know, the, the, the true uh, grit that he had in fighting for the things that he believed in. Coleman was in a city that he felt was an icon for black life in America. And so he felt like, hey, I have to go out here and be everything that I claim to be. And excuse the English, but even in some instances, a nigga. You know, that's what he felt. He felt he had to fight on that level and bring what he had to bring to the table on that level so that his white counterparts would understand that, hey, I mean, business, and this is what it is. So you came in here to do a chop job, obviously. No, and, I didn't. and that's what you've done. That's not true. Oh, bull. But don't look, you look, think I'm through now? Let's, 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 let's. Why do you get so angry? Why do you get so defensive? I'm not defensive. I am angry. I'd be a goddamn fool to discuss with you on public uh, uh, television an allegation, which would be the same as taking a goddamn stand. And who the f do you think you are to come in here and cross-examine me? Well, it's not a cross-examination. Well, it's a it sure the hell isn't. It's a question, and a valid question. Yeah, you're out of line. And as far as I'm concerned, the interview's concluded. Meanwhile, on June 6, 1970, a son was born to Bernard and Carolyn Kilpatrick. His name was Kwame Malik. His birth was a joy to the family, but it would be only a matter of time before that same baby boy would grow up to fill the big shoes that Coleman Young once wore. I think that Kwame had potential to be a Coleman. Kwame attended Detroit's Cass Technical High School, where he made friends that he would keep through most of his adult years. He then moved down to Tallahassee, where he went to Florida A&M University. While there, he became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, was captain of the football team and ultimately graduated with honors in 1992 with a BS in political science and a teaching certificate. That was a brilliant giant. Brilliant. And he still is. But the political fire was already burning inside him. And it wasn't long before he headed back to Detroit. Lucky for him, his family had already set the framework for a great beginning in politics, and he was ready to make a name for himself. Ordinary man doing extraordinary things. You know, clothes and crack houses, and food and clothing to the needy, registering people to vote, and fighting injustice. By 2001, he was the youngest mayor elected in the history of the city at 31 years of age.
After a motivating inaugural speech, Kwame got right to work and brought some familiar faces with him, including Christine Beatty and Derek Miller. It took no time for the people of Detroit to fall in love with Kwame for his charismatic attitude and his dedication to helping the residents of Detroit. You know, he was hired in the office to, you know, make the city better no matter who does it. I voted for Kwame. For when, I, when we first got in office, he did a good, he did a so far of a good job. I remember when Kwame first took office, the city was very divided. The older people was like, no, we don't want him, you know. The younger people was like, yeah, Kwame, Kwame, you know, the city's about to be back on point, you know. He was one of the youngest persons ever to become a mayor at 30 years old. I had a last name, I respected that. He did damn good. We got three casinos, we got the streets getting fixed, we got all types of shit popping off, but it's a whole bunch of rundown shit that just make us look raggedy now. You know, someone that can relate, you know, to what's going on and we're gonna build the city back up. But Palmy really scored the winning game basket when he brought the roar back to the city by bringing the Detroit Lions back to Ford Field and moving the Detroit Tigers right next door with Comerica Park. You know, when you look at the new stadiums and the things that were accomplished like that, we have beautiful stadiums here. We had Super Bowls, we had All-Star Games. I mean, the city buzzed. He knows uh, where he came from and how, how, what it would take for a black man to actually be successful in this, uh, as Tupac put it, white man's world. My name is W.T. Williams Jr. That's W period, T period, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S Jr. Kwame was a, a breath of fresh air. Uh, it wasn't uh, politics as usual or politics as usual. It was a new idea, uh, a new age, uh, political understanding uh, from a younger standpoint, uh, bringing a youthful thought to Detroit uh, that would give us a new beginning. Immediately, the new mayor took action on revamping the city and became Detroit's starting player. My name is Daryl Sewell, D-A-R-Y-L-S-E-W-E-L-L. -L. You know, you had, we had the Super Bowl here. You know, we got the city walk and so forth. You know, he was the man for the job. You know, he had high hopes. You know, he bought some things the other mayors couldn't do. Everything was good. I, I liked the Kwame. I liked the young man. Yes, I did. I can say he did the he did the damn thing. From there, the mayor used his creative abilities to take the monies generated by the casinos to create a loan program to assist neighborhood businesses. He did a lot of things that I think not only increased revenue here, but helped to increase the pride again as well. Kwame also helped out new entrepreneurs by working with the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation to simplify the process of opening a new business, giving potential businessmen a real fighting chance to open a new company. We were moving. We were resurrecting. There was a spirit of hope going on. Kwame also continued to paint the town red with new industry. Building parks, fixing up parks that were dying, being left astray. Uh, building new parks from the ground up, uh, paving the roads at a record, record rate, uh, fixing the street light. That's important, I think, for a city to keep thriving. The mayor continued to work his magic by increasing sales in the housing market and property tax cuts to homeowners. Our taxes now, you know, have shot so high, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy because you're looking at houses that taxes used to be seven, eight hundred dollars a year. They're like $1,800 now, $2,100 a year. He worked hard to pull Detroit down from the murder capital by cutting crime and tearing down vacant buildings, two serious concerns among residents. I'm a street nigga, so I'm gonna tell you the real shit. All this scrapping and shit, wasn't none of that shit happening when Kwame was in office. And it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. Motherfuckers were selling big dope when Kwame was in office. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The bag was coming in, I'm gonna tell you the truth. The bag was coming in, everybody was eating. I really appreciate the Kilpatrick administration. You know, they worked good with us on these crack houses and this crime and uh, all of that that's going on. We cannot deny the fact that we do have massive vacancy. We do have uh, some issues with our public school system. Detroit is not murder town, it's Motown. You know, Detroit uh, is not the murder city, it's, it's, it's the renaissance city. This is the rise and fall. While Kwame was heavily supported in the city, the surrounding suburbs didn't feel the same about the so-called hip-hop mayor. I suspected from the very start. I really did. You could see very early on, what was he really gonna do? People wanna hear, you know, great speeches. And when they hear a great speech, that seems to inspire them and they wanna vote for the person, whether it has substance or not. And Kwame was good at that. 
Kwame was known to wear designer suits and to sparkle with a diamond earring, similar to a rap star. Some even deemed him the hip hop mayor. Uh, I know they called him stuff like the hip hop mayor. And they had a fit because he had an earring in. The reality is the guy had some vision and we were moving. And I think that was important. There was definitely some deep-rooted tensions between the predominantly African-American city and the majority white suburbs. What, was yeah. he the hip-hop mayor? Yes, he was. He wanted to be. <laughs> he really did. He wanted to be loved by the, you know, by the hip-hop people in Detroit. There's no doubt about that. He wanted to be one of the, one of the guys. What were you thinking when you saw him with the big earrings and the designer shoes? What, what went through your mind? Well, I thought, Kwame, you need to grow up. <laughs> Come on, this is this is serious stuff here, and you're you're a you're a figure that people are going to look up to, look to to solve a problem. You know, you got you got to act a little more mature than that. You know. Though monumental change was occurring in the city, Kwame was also drawing attention for some bad decisions he was making. Our first story is not a story about a city. It's a story about some Americans who may be sending a kind of warning to the rest of us. A warning about what can happen when bitter polarization takes over the place where you live. In this community, the rich are divided from the poor, the race is divided from each other, and it's all compounded by violence and drugs. We're talking about Detroit, once a symbol of U.S. competitive vitality, and some say still a symbol, a symbol of the future the first urban domino to fall. And standing at the center of it all, a controversial mayor facing charges that a lot of the blame lies at his feet. I look forward to complete exoneration once all the facts surrounding this matter have been brought forth. The mayor was criticized for using city funds to lease a car for his family and then used his city credit card for lavish spa massages, extravagant dining, and expensive wines. It's not their money, it's our money. It's the people's money. When politicians, all the politicians, finally realize that, I think they'll start to do the right thing. The mayor's office says the mayor, not the taxpayers, will pay for Smith and Webb services. Too much money, I mean, everybody turned evil. Motherfuckers corrupt every day. The, the downfall of what, he was too young when he got in office and he, had, he let the power go to his head. That's what went, that's what went down with him. In the end, Kwame would have to pay back $9,000 of the $210,000 in charges he accumulated. Character is said to be the sum total of qualities. And every quality that goes into one's character is derived from a human experience. And so guidance is always necessary with the young. Kwame Kilpatrick was a young man, brilliant. Brilliant. You know, all you need is for leaders is to talk about one negative. And that one negative will blind you to all the good. But the mayor's real problems began after rumors of an alleged Manugian mansion party started to circulate in the fall of 2002. It's a story that haunted former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick's administration, the rumored wild party at the Manugian mansion. Now a witness has come forward with explosive new testimony. He says the party did indeed happen, and at least one other high-ranking official was there. Damn, yeah. What you think, boy? You and a mansion? What kind of shit is that? Mansion? Nothing but hoes? Oh my goodness. Strippers? Oh man, they're getting nasty. Yeah. See, here's the thing about Kwame's whole tenure. It was a matter of him being omnipotent. Uh, I can do whatever. I mean, if you ever were a Star Trek fan, you know there was a guy called Q. And Q was completely omnipotent. He could do whatever, whenever. That's Kwame. Attorney Norman Yatuma says this affidavit represents an enormous break in proving an alleged cover-up. For the first time, a witness on the record saying he was at the rumored but never proven Manugian Mansion party thrown by former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick in the fall of 2002. The mayor is a young man, so we make bad choices, so I just assumed that his hormones was thinking. You're the mayor, right? You do what the fuck you want to do, right? So, uh, yes, we're throwing a party. We're throwing a party over here. You come here, too. We want everybody to come. Everybody come party, come hang out with us. Whatever goes down, go now. Shh, don't tell nobody. And the plot continued to thicken once the media attempted to connect to Mayor Green's murder to the mayor. Do you not have an office? Uh, I have two. 
Do you not have anything else better to do? Go to your office. I know one of my offices. No, this is my husband's office. <laughs> Sweetie. I will you have nothing else to say. Leave. You have nothing Excuse else to me? say. I need you to leave this office. Whoa! <laughs> oh. Chill, chill, chill. You see, when I'm not here, as the chief of staff, as she chief holds of staff, things does down. Does she not have her own office? And she's in here taking care of business she's with, not, she with my secretary. Her, she needs to take care of business in her office. Didn't we discuss we this to already? We together, Ms. Kennedy, in the same well, office. Well, handle the so business in her office. Of. Handle the business in she's her office. Scandal in the city. <laughs> <laughs> the movie, 313 Story, featuring me. He knew Tammy Green, so he knew that to be Tammy Green who was providing Kwame Kilpatrick a lap dance. He says that Carlita came in, assaulted Tammy Green. I think the word he used was that she punched her and that they collapsed on a coffee table, broke the table, and that Carlita used a leg of that table to, to beat Tammy Green with. Yutuma calls this a motive for a murder cover-up by the ex-mayor, since dancer Tamara Green was shot to death in April of 2003. Mrs. Green, I don't remember the first name. She was there with two other ladies. She was, uh, she's a dancer. She was working. And his wife came home unexpectedly um, and um, started assaulting her. Uh, I think it was a bat, but I can't remember. The 27-year-old exotic dancer, who went by the name Strawberry, allegedly performed at the Manugian Mansion party and may have been assaulted by the mayor's wife, Carlita. It is perhaps the most notorious unsolved murder in Detroit. Who killed stripper Tamara Green? You know, she got caught up in some street shit. You know, that street shit, you know, is different. A civil suit was filed against Kwame on the heels of the murder. The latest explosive revelation came to light just yesterday. Um, I don't believe that there was one thing in this case that was proven on the plaintiff's side. Meanwhile, Former Detroit Homicide Lieutenant Alvin Bowman filed an affidavit in federal court on March 3rd, 2008, saying that he believes a Detroit police officer killed the exotic dancer, Tamara Green. Tammy Green's mother has never wavered. Her daughter's killer, whatever the motive, she says, should be punished to the highest level the law allows. I would like to see that person come to justice. Does it bother you that it's taken this long and so far you still? It don't bother me how long it takes. I just want them to pay for what they did. Just days after I spoke to Brenda Green in May of 2008, the victim's family thought they had reason to finally celebrate some closure. When Detroit Police Chief Ella Bully Cummings, in a hastily called press conference, said the department had identified a suspect. Strawberry, as the exotic dancer was known, had been killed in a feud between rival drug dealers and was not murdered in a scenario related to the hot topic rumor of Green dancing at the never proven Manugian Mansion party, being injured in an attack by Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick's wife Carlita, and months later gunned down because the strippers sought hush money from the Kilpatricks. The cold case police detective in the case is certain the killing had no ties to the mayor. The fact is, I uncovered nothing regarding Kwame Kilpatrick's involvement in this murder. Months of investigation had concluded Darrett Little D. King was the most likely suspect. That the April 30th, 2003 drive-by shooting, the attack on Strawberry's car, left her as collateral damage and not the intended target. It was an attempted assassination of the passenger, a drug dealer named Eric Mitchell. Now from state prison behind the walls of the Macomb Correctional Facility in New Haven, Darrett King speaks of the accusation for the first time and insists he didn't do it. You say that you had nothing to do with her death. Exactly. I took a lie detector test. The victim said I didn't do it. I mean, what else could you ask for? The victim said you didn't do it. Yeah. That is that the survivor. Yeah. Indeed, the survivor was Eric Mitchell, who was shot five times, while the driver, Tamara Green, was shot three times. She was behind the wheel, closest to the street and the drive-by vehicle. Carlisle says just how many times bullets struck the victims could be an indication that the shooter was after Mitchell and that Green was simply in the line of fire. According to police, Mitchell is King's former partner in the drug business. 
Are you surprised that they named you publicly, but they haven't come to you with charges? Yeah, of course. That's crazy. They didn't tore my life to pieces with that. My family, kids, everything. King is now serving 14 to 25 years in state prison for attempted murder and other charges not related to the Green case. But for several reasons, Carlisle believes he should be charged in Green's murder. Among the elements of an arrest warrant, the white SUV that was the drive-by vehicle that night. Little D's wife was in possession of a white Lincoln Navigator. That she affirmed in a statement also. All right, that by itself doesn't mean a lot. But it's one item on a list of circumstantial evidence. The fact that King is left-handed, as was the shooter, according to witnesses. The fact that officers, first at the scene, said Mitchell told them Little D was the person that he was having problems with. And then there's the statement made by a big-time drug kingpin named Tommy Hodges, who claims Little D admitted to him he was responsible for the drive-by. And Tommy Hodges gave me a statement about Little D approaching him and told him what had occurred that night. Now, one of the things Tommy Hodges asked Little D was, well, why, what about the old girl? And the only thing Little D told him, she was in the way. Everything that Carlisle ever did uh, pertaining to me is a dead end and it's made up everything. Every, if you look at the statements, you look at the evidence, Carlisle is just a crooked cop and hopefully it'll come out in the, in the future. Do you think he killed Tamara Green? I think he has something to do with it. In my opinion, I think his wife has something to do with that. I think his wife has something to do with that from my point of view. They want to make him a bad guy. And in order to make somebody a true bad guy, you have to have an absolute crime. Because in America, to be honest with you, when the crime only ends up in you getting money, we don't villainize you. Uh, as a matter of fact, you almost become a hero. He might not have did it at his own hand. He might not even tell the motherfucker to do it. But shit, somebody did it. In this sense, lynchings were celebrations. See, people get caught up on the hanging thereof. They, they're using Kwame Kilpatrick uh, to co-sign on the same messages that they've been spreading about black people since we got here, uh, which, is, which is a tragedy uh, because there was so much hope. There's so much hope in Kwame Kilpatrick. Rasul Hakim Mohammed. Rasul is R-A-S-U-L, Hakim, H-A-K-I-M. Mohammed, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. My mother is Tainetta Mohammed, father, the Honorable Elijah Mohammed. My mother was born and raised here, graduated from Central High, you know, back in the mid 50s. And my father, of course, was born in Georgia, and, uh, but he came here in the early 1920s. Kwame Kilpatrick was a young man. He made a very powerful statement in an interview that he did with the Final Call newspaper, our our media newspaper. He said these words. He said, sometimes in life, man, they're powerful. I'm just reflecting on it. He said, sometimes our talent can take us where our character is not ready to go. Kwame, I actually had a chance to hear you speak at Eastern Michigan University about redemption. Um, are you redeemed for some of the things that you've done? Or do you believe that there is a conspiracy to bring down black politics in the city of Detroit? The overpowering uh, media who still ran stories and never that has, has gotten people confused in time. And, and it was all done, uh, you know, to undermine the intelligence of Detroit is what you did, you know. Uh, what you did. They are no longer in charge of their own thinking as a community. They, they don't think for themselves, not the leaders, the ecumenical community, nor the citizens. And they are constantly being driven by other folks' dreams, imaginations, and thoughts. And so they are doomed because they have lost their ability to think for themselves. It was definitely turning out to be an interesting first term, but despite his unpopularity, Kwame still managed to pull out another win for a second term. In the meantime, I will remain focused on moving this city forward with the key initiatives that we've laid out before you. 
Then reports came out that Kwame had used $9,000 from his secret Kilpatrick Civic Fund to take his wife, three sons, and a babysitter on a week-long vacation to La Costa Resorts and Spa in California. After Kwame got caught taking vacations on the public dime and getting navigators for his wife on the public dime, this is all, you know, these are, this, this is a drop in the bucket of his first term. And then he got reelected. And these were things that were exposed before the election. He got reelected. How did that happen? I mean, I wouldn't vote for him. About a year after winning his second term, things started to heat up once again, as Kwame was accused of bypassing the water board and city council on at least two decisive contracts. The city of Detroit, we have the best fresh drinking water on the planet. My name is Barry Ross, B-A-R-R-Y-R-O-S-S. -S. It almost seems to me that there's some divine plan to lose our population, I mean, with Detroit now losing, the potential of losing uh, the ability to control the water, schools closing, um, murder is continuing to happen. And in, in, in some far-reaching sense, it seems to me that some of this could be squashed. I grew up in Detroit, I went to high school, I went to elementary school, went to junior high in Detroit. Um, I'd hate to see the city going down the drain and it really see what's happened. It seems to me that that's the case. And things seemed to only get worse for the mayor, as allegations that Kwame was exchanging explicit text messages with his chief of staff, Christine Beattie. Kilpatrick's tangled web now jeopardizes what was once a promising fresh start for a struggling city. The son of a member of Congress and a county commissioner, he was elected in 2001 to great fanfare. But rumors of extramarital trysts and a raucous party with strippers at the mayor's mansion began swirling provoking the brash young mayor's ire. I don't whore around on my wife. The rumors hardened into confidential police reports and an investigation by the deputy police chief, who was abruptly fired in retaliation, he said. It was about um, the mayor being concerned that if we started to do an investigation regarding those issues, that the onion would start to unravel and the affair that he was having with Christine Beatty might come up. Kilpatrick and his former chief of staff, Christine Beatty, now face 12 felony counts of perjury, obstruction of justice, and misconduct in office, all stemming from their insistent denials in court that they did not have an affair and improperly fire three policemen to keep the affair quiet. During the time period, 2001 and 2003, were you and Mayor Kilpatrick either romantically or in, in, intimately involved with each other? No. Did you ever send the mayor or receive from the mayor a text message which was of an intimate or sexual nature? No. A jury believed otherwise and awarded $6.4 million to Brown and two other police officers who brought the whistleblower suit. An incredulous mayor vowed to fight on. Um, I don't believe that there was one thing in this case that was proven on the plaintiff's side. But then a curious turnabout. The mayor suddenly approved a settlement to the three police officers for $8.4 million. Why? because a trove of 14,000 text messages obtained by the whistleblower's lawyer that directly contradict the mayor and Beatty's sworn testimony. In one, Beatty writes, I'm feeling like I want another night like the most recent Saturday at the Residence Inn. You made me feel so damn good that night. The mayor replies, I feel that we can do that in West Virginia and just relax together. I need you so bad. I want to wake up in the morning and you are there. Make it happen. Love you. It's really not about the sex and the text messages and the affair. This, this, this really is about perjury. This, is, this really is about the ruining of three police officers' careers. Well, I was running Shane Park. During my stay at Shane Park, he became the mayor. Once he became the mayor, he came over and talked with us a while. When I first saw the text messages, and I, I did download them and I went to try reading them, he couldn't get a lot out of them because a lot was blacked out. A lot of stuff that I was really looking for was blacked out. 
some of the things that they said, I thought it was personal. And I don't think it should have been put out to the media like it was. That's been going on for ages. He's not the first one that's done that. He may have been the first one that got caught. Clinton, not the first president that kicked it around with female. You know? But he the first one that got caught. But he did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> he did not inhale. In August 2007, the duo would go on trial in the whistleblower lawsuit. In Kwame's testimony, he would express anger and disgust about the allegations of an affair between the two. I don't whore around on my wife. Would you ever use the text message system to communicate messages of a personal nature to the mayor? No. Did you ever receive messages from the mayor of a personal nature? No. And by personal, I mean messages which were not strictly pertaining to city government matters. No. One month after the trial started, and after three hours of deliberations, a verdict awarded the plaintiffs $6.5 million in damages. Kwame was upset about the decision and said that race had something to do with the verdict. You know, I, I live in Texas now, and I, I was listening to a group of people talk in a locker room after playing golf one day, and it was a group of white men, and they just said they don't like him. He's too arrogant. I can't stand him. In the past 30 days, I've been called a more than any time in my entire life. In the past three days, I've received more death threats than I have in my entire administration. This unethical, illegal, lynch mob mentality has to stop. I don't think he was scared to inadvertently uh, not as directly as, uh, sometimes directly, he would uh, use the race card. Court today appeared to be a throwback to South Africa during the days of apartheid. No wonder it appears many whites in the suburbs of Detroit dislike the former mayor as many blacks in Detroit till su still support him and pray for him. Any merit to this? It seems they're playing the race card here. I don't, I don't think that, that the race card is not even an issue here. This is uh, corruption and politics and politics and <laughs> that old night. Race is like the, the most smallest part of this whole thing. <laughs> you know, I still think it's a little racism left over. You know, I mean, it's modern day racism. You know, these people want to use, you know, you know, you know, take something like, you know, they took something like Kwame, like, what is wife go to get her hair done at? Come on now. Who the fuck want to know about Carlita Kirkpatrick getting her motherfucking toes done? Not me. The city of Detroit is probably, what, 80% black. Let me put it this way. Very, very few times has Kwame actually disrespected the suburbs more than he disrespected his own city. He disrespected the city of Detroit Insanely, you know. On March 18th, 2008, the Detroit City Council passed a non-binding resolution asking the mayor to resign. Public servants should be accountable to the people that they serve. Therefore, after much deliberation with my family, after numerous prayers and fasting, I have made the difficult decision, I believe the most difficult decision of my life to step down as mayor of the city of Detroit. Kwame stepping down from, from office. Uh, Kwame tried to frame it as, I shouldn't have to step down for committing adultery on my wife, which uh, wasn't the case. It was all the corruption and fraud coming to light, and he just happened to also get caught sleeping with his assistant. Only a few days later, Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy announced a 12-count indictment against the mayor and former Chief of Staff Christine Beatty, charging Kwame with eight felonies and Beatty with seven. Even children understand that lying is wrong. Well, at that point, you know, it was, you know, it was six of one, half dozen the other at that point, you know, saying he was too far in the, you know. Once he resigned, it left itself wide open. Though. 
because he lost a lot of protection that he had. I believe in Kwame M. Kilpatrick. Now, we all fall short and we all have errors. And I believe that Kwame Kilpatrick is a great man. And I believe that he fell, fallen from grace, and that happens in life. But I do believe he will get up and he will become a great man. I feel that he had a great opportunity as a young black person, and he's messing it up for a lot of people. The glass had shattered for the mayor, and the end was near. On September 18th, 2008, Kwame Kilpatrick officially resigned as the head of Detroit. The resignation followed two guilty pleas for felony counts of obstruction of justice. From a mansion to a jail cell, tomorrow will be a historic day in Detroit as former mayor Kwame Kilpatrick begins serving his sentence. In less than 24 hours, the former mayor of Detroit will turn in his designer suits for a prison-issued uniform, and he will be living on the second floor of the Wayne County Jail. Once in a while, we're required to house a high-profile inmate. Uh, whether it be Jack Kevorkian or any of a number of other people. After 99 days, Kwame left the Wayne County Jail and boarded a private plane for Texas in February of 2009. In no time at all, Kwame was working for Coficent, a Texas subsidiary of CompuWare owned by Peter Kamanos, which is actually based in Detroit. As part of his deal, Kwame was ordered to pay $1 million in restitution. And thanks to his new high-paying job, the former mayor was expected to make a $6,000 payment every month. I'm going to do everything I can to pay this because I need to get out of your way. I need to get out of your way. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I almost cried again last night riding around the city. It's Christmas time. There should be so much going on. There should be activity and things happening. And it's just so depressing. Things were looking up for the former mayor, but soon his arrogance and disregard for the court system would land him back in the hot seat. I say it all the time, I want to pay my restitution. It matters not. I just don't want to harass me from this creepy the prosecutor. Now, Kwame Kilpatrick still has to pay his restitution. He owes $860,000. asked me to bring $20,000 to the court that day. And the last thing they asked me to do was to pay a million dollars. And the trouble is kept piling on Kilpatrick today. His Texas employer, CompuWare, owned by Peter Carmanos, fired him today. Under this administration, Detroit has become an example of progress and resilience. From there, Kwame told the judge he only had $6 for restitution payments, and he didn't know who paid for his new Escalade, million-dollar home, plastic surgery for his wife, and other expenses. You will serve a maximum of five years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. In that moment, former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick realized it was over. He was going to prison at least 14 months, maximum five years, for violating probation, ending a drawn-out battle over money and telling the truth. In the hour-long hearing, Kilpatrick made a last attempt to sway Judge David Groner. He struggled with his composure at first, but then spoke almost 20 minutes, insisting he wasn't hiding anything. But I never lied to this court. I've never willfully violated anything from this court. I'm here because of my confusion with some of the written orders. Kilpatrick spoke about his family and the debt he had to his wife for his infidelity. I cheated on my wife, y'all. I spent a whole year feeling an enormous amount of guilt for what I did to my wife, my children, and this city. I respectfully and humbly ask for everything that's in me to, to be free. I want to go home, y'all, where I belong. The judge took it all in and then made it perfectly clear Kilpatrick wasn't going home. You balked, feigned poverty, and misrepresented your financial status. Living in a million dollar home, driving brand new Escalades, shopping at high-end designer stores, and purchasing elective surgery for your wife. You have made it perfectly clear that now it is more important for you to pacify your wife instead of complying with my court orders. The judge told Kilpatrick it was because he hid assets, did not report gifts, improperly took money from political funds, and at the heart of it all, didn't tell the truth. You lied to this court. Continued to lie after pleading guilty to lying in court. 
Obviously, there has been no rehabilitation. The judge sentenced Kilpatrick to prison. Deputies stepped in quickly to handcuff him. Kilpatrick said a few things to his sister, Ayanna, and he was gone. I lied on the stand about a relationship that I had, a romantic relationship. Yes, I broke the law. Yes, I shouldn't have done it. Yes, I'm uh, overcome um, with sorrow uh, and, and uh, from, from the hurt and pain that I've caused my wife and family. When I went to the pit, you know, I, I went from meeting with presidents and world leaders to sitting in the hole being handcuffed, taken to the shower court. And it was in that womb, I think, of pain and, and space and darkness that Surrender was born. On June 23, 2010, the former mayor was charged with a whole new slew of charges. But this time, it wasn't from the city. It was from the federal government. Former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick once announced he would not mess with the IRS, but this 19-count indictment tells a very different story. Today, Action News was there as a federal grand jury that has been investigating Kilpatrick handed over this indictment to a magistrate. Kwame Kilpatrick is charged with 10 counts of mail fraud, 3 counts of wire fraud, five counts of filing a false tax return and one count of tax evasion. The charges all stem from Kilpatrick's controversial Civic Fund. The Civic Fund is supposed to be a tax-exempt social welfare organization. As the Action News investigators have shown through the years, the nonprofit seemed to be more of a slush fund for the mayor and his pals. This indictment alleges Kilpatrick received at least $640,000 of unreported taxable income from the Civic Fund. According to the indictment, Kilpatrick gave himself cash kickbacks and used the fund to pay for anti-bugging equipment, yoga, golf lessons, summer camps for his kids, even the lease of a Cadillac DeVille. I feel like mother, god damn! Woo hoo! Kwame, 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 listen man, like you hear this motherfucker, listen, hold your motherfucking head up, don't tell them motherfuckers shit! An allegation is an allegation, and proof is another thing. And, and, and that's what happens in court with a jury of 12. You know what I'm saying? I said, uh, 33 count indictment, I, they had to take me to the mental. I'm like, uh, I'm, I, I don't know shit. I, I don't know nothing, nothing, nothing. I would have told the motherfuckers, flat out, kiss my motherfucking ass, you federal motherfuckers. In his most recent mugshot, a slimmed-down Kwame Kilpatrick cracks a smile for the camera, a somewhat jovial demeanor considering the trouble he's facing now. Bobby Ferguson has been indicted by a federal grand jury. And the name Bobby Ferguson kept popping up. It was just a matter of time before the mayor's good friend and contractor would get in some trouble of his own. Well, Ferguson is in some serious trouble, Diana. If he's convicted of the most serious charge, money laundering, that carries up to 20 years in prison. 38-count federal indictment accuses former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick and longtime friend and businessman Bobby Ferguson of receiving tens of millions of dollars from municipal contracts. But where is all that money? They're going to need Houdini to find the cash. Former Kilpatrick advisor Adolph Mongo doubts Kwame Kilpatrick has any money. I had to fight them at times to, to get them to pay me when I was advising uh, the former mayor. So for them to have all this money, I'm, I'm shocked. But according to the recent indictment, some examples of the money flowing to and from the Kilpatrick-Ferguson connection include a substantial portion of a $140 million contract for a pump station, a $19.8 million downtown water main replacement contract, which allegedly resulted in Ferguson getting $4 million, and a $28 million sewer contract, which netted Ferguson $1.7 million, yet he didn't do any work for the contract. Bobby motherfucking Ferguson. <laughs> well, you know, hey. So who is Bobby Ferguson and how did he get on the Fed's radar? Tonight, the investigators look deeper into the checkered past of this Kilpatrick pal. When Kwame Kilpatrick was in court for hearings that led to his imprisonment, one person was almost always there right by his side, Bobby Ferguson. Kilpatrick and Ferguson have been close friends for years, and many have questioned whether Ferguson's friendship with Kilpatrick has put him on the inside track for city business. Published reports say Ferguson has landed an astonishing $170 million in city construction and demolition contracts. $170 million. 
He wasn't always the lowest bidder, and a lot of the contracts had cost overruns. A $1.3 million exterior facelift at Kobo wound up costing $5.5 million. A $7 million interior renovation at Kobo had a half million in cost overruns. He bid $1.4 million for excavation work at Ford Field, and it wound up costing nearly twice that. Ferguson landed a $7 million job to gut the Book Cadillac Hotel, even though his company had no experience with high-rise demolition and was not the low bidder. Nobody has questioned the quality of Ferguson's work, but how did he get so many city jobs with so many cost overruns? When he was asked about his friendship with Kilpatrick in a 2006 deposition, he was evasive, even after his own lawyer told him to answer the question. But if you can answer yes or no, whether you and the mayor are friends. I know the mayor. I know him too. <laughs> yeah, I can't call him my friend. In 2008, the Free Press dropped a bombshell, uncovering text messages that appeared to show collusion. Text between Ferguson and Kilpatrick's lover and chief of staff, Christine Beatty, suggested Ferguson had gotten inside information from Beatty to help land city contracts. In January of 2009, federal agents swooped in, executing search warrants at two of Ferguson's companies and hauling out boxes of records. The search warrants were sealed and the feds were tight-lipped, but word leaked out that the raids were tied to the pay-to-play corruption investigation at City Hall. Ferguson's problems didn't start with the feds. He's had run-ins with the law dating back to his teenage years. At 18, he was convicted in Farmington Hills of assaulting a bouncer at a bar with a baseball bat, but the record was expunged. I don't think he was no, really no mafia. I think he was just a focus of, you know, once the media get the hate show ass, you can go piss in the wrong toilet and they're going to they gonna broadcast it. So. Over the years, he's faced a slew of charges, including felonious assault, assault with intent to commit murder, and carrying a concealed weapon. But all those charges were either dropped or lowered. In 2005, a felony charge finally stuck. Ferguson was convicted of pistol whipping an employee named Kennedy Thomas, leaving Thomas with a permanent brain injury. Even then, Ferguson got off relatively easy. Only 10 months in jail, and he was out 13 hours every day on work release. And during the Super Bowl, the deal was sweetened even more. I exposed how Ferguson was being released from jail for 20 hours a day, just before the Super Bowl, to do an emergency teardown of the old Motown building. Two weeks from now, it'll be a parking lot. We see some cars parked out here, hopefully. But Wayne County prosecutor Kim Worthy wasn't impressed. She went to court and got some extra time tacked onto Ferguson's sentence to make up for his little Super Bowl break. He should have stayed out of it. You got a million dollar enterprise with Ferguson Enterprises. You're getting all these contracts and building houses. Sit your ass down. What you corrupt for? By the end of 2010, the feds would drop a bomb on the city of Detroit. A federal grand jury handed down an indictment under the RICO Act. The former Detroit mayor, joined by his father, city contractor Bobby Ferguson, longtime friend and former aide Derek Miller, and the former head of the city's water department, Victor Mercado. The men accused of pocketing tens of millions of dollars through what prosecutors call the Kilpatrick Enterprise, shaking down city contractors for bribes. The RICO Act is usually associated with big-time crime lords and criminal organizations like the Gattis and the Gambinos. But people across the city of Detroit question whether Kwame really deserved the RICO Act. I don't see them as smart as the Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky or the Gottis or the Bambito family, et cetera, et cetera. I, I just don't see it. U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid has indicated that hundreds of thousands of exhibits exist in this case, including wiretaps, text messages, contracts, and more. Nah, you see, I don't think he was no goddamn right, Bugsy Calhoun, none of them motherfuckers. You know, I mean, he was a mayor. They just made a mistake, and they drilled on that mistake. It made him feel like, you know, like he was bigger than life or something. Kwame Kilpatrick becomes the proof that Detroit is corrupt. I mean, that is despicable. So I'm corrupt because Kwame Kilpatrick is in jail. Now, what's, what, what's fucked up is going to be if, if he get acquitted of all these, what are people going to say then? I want to emphasize tonight that I take full responsibility for my own actions, for the poor judgment that they reflected. I wish with all my heart that we could turn back the hands of time and tell that young man to make better choices.
but I can't. Our challenge now is to put the anguish and the turmoil of the recent months behind us. The city's got to grow. It's a major metropolis. And it's got to grow and, and be able to bounce back the way it was. Businesses got to come back in here so we can get this economy rising and striving and home values can go back up. We hear Kwame name every day. My little niece in Alabama know Kwame Kirkpatrick's name. That is bad. It's national. It's interesting to see now how the younger generation kind of looks at it as a, as a blank canvas right now and they're saying, what can we do? Yeah, I truly believe that, uh, yeah. that they're gonna make a strong example out of Kwame Kilpatrick, which uh, is gonna put fear in our young generation. You gotta think about it, when he got in the office, he was young. Everybody wanted him in a position to do something greater than what he was ready for. You know, should he go to jail and stuff like that? I mean, I like Kwame, Kwame, you know what I'm saying, cool cat, you know what I mean? He, you know what I'm saying, one of them people I, I got mad respect for. But in that particular situation, I felt like this, if it was one of us, they wouldn't hesitate. <laughs> they wouldn't even hesitate to lock us up or stuff like that, you know what I mean, for real. You disrespected the city of Detroit insanely, you know? The city of Detroit raised him, and that's his mother, and he's the crackhead that just stole his mother's TV, <laughs> you know, because because his, his mother has supreme confidence in him. And that you understand the relationship that I'm putting out there. His, your mother, you could do no wrong in your mother's eyes. And that was the city of Detroit for Kwame Kilpatrick. Trying to put money back into the city, not take out of the city. So my answer to that, yes, he did hurt the city. He did. And here he let a lot of people, he let his voters down for him too, because we believed in him. You know what I'm saying? Not only that, we believed in him because it was it was a stereotype saying a young black man at the age of 30 couldn't get the job done, and he let us down. He let himself down. He let his family down. Oh. Job rate done went down. Everybody leaving Michigan. You seen the census? We done lost population like a motherfucker. I don't nobody want to be here no more. I don't even want to be here. Only reason I'm here because I'm on papers. Can't find a job. PL told me she gonna violate me if I can't find a job. All I can do is fill out the application. If don't nobody hire me with eight felonies, fuck him. True. I'm gonna get out here and do what I know best. Just like Kwame did. He got out here and do what he, did what he knew best. Kwame Kilpatrick definitely was a man that possessed the qualities to run the city. But his personal and professional decisions took an amazing opportunity right out of his hands. The way he will be remembered will always be bittersweet. But one thing's for sure, he's done things for Detroit that will always be remembered. And though it appears as though he could never return, many say Kwame Kilpatrick will be back. I hope he chooses to learn from his mistakes and his errors and come back. Come back to any power position that God will allow him and continue to express God in everything he does. But this time with a better character. Thanks.
This city will be clean when visitors can. I can do all of that and mean it and do it. But I forgot that I didn't go to church and pray and I didn't go to my son's big merit achievement award thing because I was at Russell Ferry trying to get the trucks out of the snow.